Hello, my friends. I hope you're doing well. This is Heather, and this is our weekly celebrity chat. And you know that I'm a firm believer that wellness is not just physical wellness. It's not just how much you weigh or all of energy or how tall you are, but it's also financial wellness. And this week, I'm talking to Jamie Madigan all about financial wellness and super interesting things that I didn't know before which I love. Uh, have a listen, give me some comments, give me a like, and uh, definitely let me know if you what you thought of this episode. Take care. I'll see you soon. Hi, my friends. Welcome. This is the Back to Me podcast, and this is Heather, and I am super excited that you're here. You are going to hear some tips and some tricks and some ideas to help you live your happiest and healthiest self. I call it Back to Me because when you are taking care of yourself, Back to Me, then you can take better care of others, and we can all make the world a better place. This is Wellness Your Way, and I am super happy that you're here. Hello, my friends. Wow, that was fast. It started recording really fast today. <laughs> this is Heather. This is another fabulous episode of the Back to Me podcast. And of course, you guys know by now that the celebrity chats are my favorite part because I get to talk to some really awesome people. And this week's super amazing celebrity, because as I said, I think everybody is a celebrity. This week is Jamie Madigan. And we are going to talk well, all things wellness, but I think we might talk a lot financial wellness today, right, Jamie? Right. Exactly. And I guess I was I always want to know a little bit about how people got into what they're what they do. How did you get into this whole financial wellness world? Or what or whatever you want to share with that kind of idea? Sure. It's actually an odd story. Um where it- something that I never really planned. I've been in financial services my whole career, some aspect of it. So 23 years now, uh, but I was actually recruited into financial planning. Really? I never thought of it, never considered it. A recruiter contacted me on LinkedIn and said, Hey, would you have any interest? We think you've got a good skill set." And the more I interviewed and talked to them and talked to different people, the more I realized, yeah, this is what I'm really passionate about i see a good opportunity here i'm fortunate enough that my dad got me started early but i know a lot of my friends network colleagues didn't start early or don't really know what they should be doing or why so i kind of fell into it and then i realized that this is what i love this is what i'm passionate about and this is where i can make a difference in people's lives and what I guess I'm curious, like what were you you were on LinkedIn? What were you looking at becoming before uh, they recruited you? I wasn't. So I just left IBM. So this would have been back in 2009. It was after 10, almost 10 years of being there. Uh, I left from there and was just taking some time because it was oh, my okay. first real break after. 10 years. I started right. working right after university, right out of university. And looking back now, I wish I had taken some time, travel, done all of that. So yeah, I was looking at it as a major milestone and either I could continue on the path that I was on or now would be a good time to transition into something else where it's still not too late. Right. It's so true. Like you, I like, I had a vice president when I was in corporate, a VP who said to me once he got to where he got by just being open to someone would suggest something and he would say, that's interesting. And then he would just, if, it, if he did actually find it interesting and he just would follow it. And he was pretty high up in the corporation when I met him, but it's so interesting that you kind of fell into it. And I liked your comment that, you know, your dad got you going on financial understanding and financial planning because I can remember when I was in my, I might have been in my, was I in my late 20s? Probably mid 20s when the first time I ever met with a financial planner. And even though I was 
uh, on the road to becoming a chartered accountant. I had never done any financial planning. And it's very different than just knowing how to be an accountant. It's more encompassing. There's more to it. There's, you, you almost need that person outside of you to help you at, like navigate it, right? Yeah, exactly. And there's so many different people and titles and roles. So financial planning means something different to everybody. And that makes it even more confusing for Canadians is that they don't always necessarily know who they're talking to or what that person can advise them on. So that's one of the first questions I always ask is, what do you think I do as a certified financial planner? What does financial planning mean to you? And have you ever had experience working with one? If so, what did you like about it? What could have been improved? And that helps me to better understand their point of view, where they're coming from. And then I explain what I do as a certified financial planner, what makes me different, all the areas that I can assist with, because people tend to think it's either investments or insurance. Right. right. That's right. where I might, that's where my mind always goes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> go, oh, financial planner, you do investments. I'm like, well, that's part of what I do. Or, oh, you do insurance. I said, well, that's part of what I do, but I do both of those plus mortgages, plus health benefits, plus group benefits. And the way I phrase it is it's really anything and everything to do with money and or your finances. And it all kind of rolls up into retirement tax and estate planning. Right. And right. I guess a lot of people don't think about retirement because it always seems so far away unless, unless their parents have said to them, you've got to make sure, you know, um, but it always seems so far away. Or like, I think about my parents. So my mother worked for the post office and she was like, I'm going to have this post office pension. Right. Didn't, right. didn't think about anything else. Yeah, we'll be fine. So, you know, you come, you become an entrepreneur and you are like, oh my God, there are no pensions. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to create my own pension. What? Right. Don't tell me this. <laughs> so when you're helping people, I guess you're figuring out first. You're figuring out what they what they know mm -hmm. or what they don't know, and then I guess you have to figure out where they are. Exactly. So where and are where they want to go. Yeah. Where are you currently at? Where do you want to be? By when? Who's important to you? What's important to you? Why? So it's really like a first date and asking all kinds of questions <laughs> You get to know one another. And it's got to go both ways, Heather, both ways, Heather, because not only do I have to determine, am I the right fit for them, but they also need to determine vice versa. So can I help them? And am I somebody that they want to work with? Yeah, true. I guess that there's a trust factor involved because it's their, uh, who knows, it's like could be everything for their future or everything. I'm thinking mortgages could be, you could be like in your twenties and need this financial planning to help you even look forward on how to manage that as you move through life. Um, and I know you usually there's, I'm thinking of that chart you put up. It has mortgages, it has insurance, it has so many things on it. And not everything, I guess, relates to everyone, but you are, you're helping them navigate what they will need. And do you, do you ever have to give them, um, give people, like if they come to you and say, you know, I want to retire at 40 as a millionaire, do you ever have to tell people, well, this is, a, <laughs> is it possible to retire at 40 as a millionaire? Maybe if you're in Bitcoins or something, but... <laughs> Well, yeah, and it all depends on where you're at. If you're 39 and you haven't started, I can almost guarantee it not going to happen. <laughs> right. But if you started when you're 20, 25, and you've been regularly saving, putting money away, and probably understood what a well-diversified portfolio was and how much risk to take on and whatnot, it could be very possible. And I guess you have to project out. Like, I know... Um... What are those people called to do the actuaries like yes. projecting out how long at some point you have to the money doesn't last forever 
but you have to kind of be able to have a educated guess on how much money will you need? Do you start with at the top and work backwards or do you start at where you are and work forwards or do you go both? Uh, so it's a, does that make sense? <laughs> I, I get where you're going. <laughs> so <laughs> I can answer it, but for the listeners tuning in, what I think you're asking Heather is trying to determine not only how much money do we need, but making sure that we don't outlive our money. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's a very important piece of what I do is when ideally would you like to retire? What is that going to look like? Where do you want to be? How much money do you think you'll need? And the younger or earlier I start the conversation, the more blank stares I get or deer in the headlights. Is I, right. What do you mean? I'm 20, <laughs> I'm 25, I'm 30, 40. I don't know. And I always say just start thinking about it envision it and at least it gives us a starting point to work towards it's not like we're casting it in stone we can never change but without giving it some thought we really have nothing to work towards and yeah a million dollars may work and that's one of the numbers that's often tossed around oh you need a million dollars to retire but no not necessarily depending on the lifestyle that you want to enjoy in retirement a million may be more than enough. It may not even be close to enough. And, and I guess it depends is, where you live too, right? Yeah. It depends on where you live, um, how much you're going to be spending, what's the cost of living, where you choose to, are you going to be traveling a lot? What's that going to look like? Are you going to be staying at the best and fanciest places, doing lots of cruises? All of that has to get factored in versus somebody who just living a simple life in the country that's going to be much cheaper than living in the heart of downtown that's have, you, have you ever had life. anyone who say they wanted to retire on cruise ships i've heard of people who just go from cruise to cruise instead of getting a retirement home they just live on a cruise ship i right? haven't at that yet but usually travel does play an important part of most retirement plans right and i was just thinking like um, cause when you're twenty or twenty your twenties and you don't have any idea, you also don't always have a lot of money, right? No. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. No, exactly. And my advice to people is to always get started. Like the best point to have started would have been yesterday. The next best time to start is right now. Right. And again, where it's not like we're setting everything in stone and predicting our future and that's the way it has to be. No, it can change tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. But the important thing is to get started, put some plans in place so that we've got something, we've got goals to work towards. And then as those goals change, well, come back, let me know. We tweak the plan and continue on the new road path. And yes, your goal should change. Every time something happens good or bad in your life, that should alter not only things like your retirement goals, but also your financial goals, which in turn should be altering your financial plan. So when you're talking financial goals, are you talking, because I, I kind of combine retirement goals and financial goals together, but maybe that's because I'm closer to retirement than, than most, than the other way. Um, so when you're talking financial goals, are you talking like income levels or savings levels or? So financial goals is anything in, anything to do with your finances. So retirement's one financial goal. Saving for your down payment for a house is right. another. Buying a vehicle, buying an investment property, buying a cottage, saving up for that cruise ship or saving up for multiple cruise um, vacations back to back. All of those, your kids' education, uh, um, grandkids' education, anything like that, anything that requires a chunk of money or that you have to save up for, all of those should be considered financial goals. And you should have a different plan or, or one big master plan for all of those goals. And anytime anything changes with any of those goals, you should be going back to your plan, tweaking it accordingly so that you stay on track 
and continue the momentum and moving forward to achieving those goals. Right. Yeah. So I'm, you know, you always see the commercials, like you suddenly have a baby that changes everything in your life, not just the amount of sleep that you get. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> exactly. Or even and I saw it, even a pet, pets can be super expensive. Oh my gosh. My friend's dog needs its teeth fixed. It's not inexpensive to have a pet these days. Um, and I saw you post recently on LinkedIn about um, insurance, things that I like, you, you've been posting things on LinkedIn about things that it never even occurred to me, like insurance on, was it your children or your grandchildren or both? Both. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of times parents and grandparents think of, okay, I've got kids or grandkids. I've got to open a RESP or registered education savings plan to help save up for their education. Yes. I highly recommend everybody should definitely do that. And again, parents or grandparents can open that because you can, get up to $7,200 of grant money for each child or grandchild from the government. And I don't know about you, but I love getting free money from the government because no it doesn't happen often. <laughs> get <laughs> it while you can. <laughs> exactly. They come and take it all the time, but don't really give too much. So we got to take it when we can. But yeah, on the flip side, what I was talking about, Heather, is insurance. So life insurance and child critical illness insurance, which parents and grandparents typically don't think of. And again, it's just because nobody's really talking about it. And having gone through my own uh, diagnosis last year and getting diagnosed with cancer, I've seen firsthand the impact that a critical illness policy can have on you. I got a nice check in the mail when I was diagnosed with cancer. And I now I don't have to worry about my financial obligations. I continue to pay, pay my bills. I can focus on treatment and recovery. And it's the same with a child. If your child were to get sick um, with a major illness, one of the parents is likely going to be taking time off of work, which could lead to lost income. And that's why I highly encourage a child critical illness policy. And then when they get into their 20s, that can be that child policy can be converted to an adult policy. And then the other thing that I was talking about is life insurance. And it's a great way, again, to get children started, protect their insurability from a young age. You can get a policy as soon as 14 days old and wow. then again transfer it over to your child or your grandchild when they become older, more responsible and let them manage it. And if it's built up enough cash, they may even want to cash it in to use for something like a down payment, like um, down payment. you're off traveling. Yeah. <laughs> Education, whatever. Um, but obviously I'm going to try to keep that in force and explain the differences between the death benefit and the cash value to them because these policies aren't always properly advertised right. or explained and people don't always take them out for the right reason. Cause a lot of times it's like, Oh, do this supplement the education. They can pay for the wedding down payment on a house, la 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 la. But you really need to look at the projections. And now that we're in such a low interest rate environment, it does take much longer for the cash value in those policies to build up. So it's not always as great as what it sounds for the investment component anyways. However, life insurance is always good to have and that will always continue to grow. And it's a nice gift to be able to give your child. And when they're in their tw late twenties, early thirties, they'll probably appreciate it that much more. Maybe not right. so much when they're a teenager and they find out that you do. Oh, great. Wow. What's this going to do? <laughs> but later on in life, as we get smarter, then we appreciate the value of it and like trust me again it goes back to getting started now you can't thank somebody enough for getting insurance in place for you from a very young age and i think we don't i i mean i never thought of it for children or grandchildren because they're little kids you're like come on what happens to little kids nothing they're so healthy and vibrant and resilient but then i get the ads for the sick kids hospital foundation so i'm like okay yeah. kids don't stay healthy and it is true you forget sometimes like maybe they don't need life insurance in the, the for the same reason adults do or 
critical illness insurance for the same reason adults do, but you forget sometimes the ripple effect of an illness on a family. It is so true that if one of your children got sick, um, you can't, somebody has to change their day-to-day, -day, whatever it is, like their job to be able to care. And I mean, the care is not always even in your city, right? Um, I know. So I'm from, I don't know if you know where it is. I'm from Brockville originally. Oh, yeah. Maybe you do. I think you do. I think we talked about that before. Um, and if you want, if you're in Brockville and you're something wrong with you, you're going to Kingston or Ottawa because mm -hmm. there's only so much Brockville General can do for you, right? And that means your parents have to go with you and they're not going to be working and they're going to be away. Yeah. So, so true. Yeah. And that's just it, Heather. And think back especially these last five years when something happens to a family whether it be a child or a parent think of all the gofundme pages that have started up now yeah and every time i see one of those it's heartbreaking because in the background i'm thinking oh there's another family where if i connected with them sooner and explained the value of insurance the different types of insurance and how cheap it can be if you start at a younger age, when you're healthy, no pre-existing health conditions, like it breaks my heart. And then going into the oncology unit now, um, every time I have a checkup appointment, it's not a fun place to be. And if people have never been there, I hope you never have to go. But again, I'm looking around, I'm like, oh, how many families could I have impacted or changed? Who's here that doesn't know about critical illness is depleting their savings. And I could have made a difference if I had talked to them a few years back. So that's really become my goal and my mission, just given everything I'm going through, is to really educate Canadians on the importance and the value of insurance. Is that how you came up with Legacy Insights? Uh, this has been a work in progress, uh, but it's, it started from there. And from working with Canadians and educating them. I started doing webinars back in 2019. Oh, okay. That, like even pre COVID. Yeah, exactly. Back when we used to do stuff in person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then shifted online. And yeah, so Legacy Insights is something that I help Canadians develop for themselves. And there's three components to it. And the first is just helping them to get their money working harder for them to achieve what I call monetary proficiency. The second is helping them to get crystal clear on what do they want their personal legacy direction to be. And then the third component of that is ensuring that they've got the right legacy support network in place to achieve what they want their personal legacy direction to be. What's in a legacy support network? That is ensuring that you've got all the right people to achieve all of your personal legacy direction goals. Do you mean like lawyers and investment people? And it's, yeah, just a... <laughs> it's really anybody and everyone that you need to support your goals, dreams, wishes. So could be wills and estate planning lawyer, real estate lawyer, um, real estate agent, accountant, bookkeeper. Um, business lawyer, if there's a family business. All right. Yeah. So it's really just walking through their specific situation. How do they want to be remembered? Um, is there an important cause? Like in my case, cancer is now an important cause and something I'm going to give back to more. Right. So it's really walking through all of those things and just how, how do they want to be remembered? What do they want their legacy to be? What do they want people to be talking about and remembering them for? And that doesn't have to wait until you're at the end of your legacy to sort that or should never be no. left to the end. Yeah. Again, that's another discussion that can still happening right now. Right. It's going to change over the course of life as you go through life, experience things, um, certain causes or people or places may become more important to you. And you may want to leave some money to them 
Uh, whereas other things that were important to you at one time, maybe don't become as important because you realize it's material and really isn't as important as you thought it may be. Right. Yeah. The things that are important to you in your twenties, if you make it to your fifties, you're not going to have the same things <laughs> that are important. And yeah. I think about, so when my, when my father-in-law passed away, um, it's funny. He did. I don't. I don't think he had thought about what kind of impact he wanted to leave or what legacy he wanted to leave. But um, my husband and I made a decision that we wanted him to have a legacy. So we set up a scholarship at uh, in his name, in my father-in-law's name, at the university where he went to school to help uh, students in uh, architecture because we thought it was uh, important. And but it's. It, if you don't think, I mean, in your 20s, it's hard to think about legacy and things that are going to be important. But yeah, and I think sometimes maybe people don't realize that they can leave a legacy yeah. other than just, you know, the relatives and, you know, dispersing your estate. Like you can, um, you don't have to have millions and millions of dollars to have your name on the side of a hospital or something like you can set up smaller legacies. <laughs> exactly. And it's not always something that families talk about either, Heather. So that's another discussion that I often help to facilitate and also often encourage that the different generations talk to one another about what are your wishes? Um, do you want a funeral service? open casket? Do you want to be cremated? Like even those details. And if it's a burial, where? What about the headstone? Uh, so obviously I realize it's not a fun discussion to have. And that's why I help to facilitate it. It's not something you want to be talking about at the next holiday family dinner. Easter but, dinner, we'll talk about funerals. Yeah. <laughs> but the sooner you have it, the better. Again, like, let's get started now. Let's have it while everyone's hopefully in good health and a good mind, because then you're not panicking at the last minute. God forbid something happen. And if something unexpected were to happen to somebody in the family, you don't want to be scrambling at the last minute wondering, oh, God, what were Jamie's wishes? Did he want to be buried, cremated? Like, does he have a will? Where is it? Does he have yeah. insurance investments? Did he have beneficiaries? And I lost my dad in December last year, but he did a great job of not only sharing his wishes with all of us, he also prepaid for everything. What? So everything wow. Was, he was super organized. Yeah. Everything was planned, paid for, also shared with us, and we knew exactly where everything was. And fortunately and unfortunately, um, because he passed away over time, we had plenty of opportunities to say goodbye to him and also get really tight on every little detail of his wishes so that we could honor those when he did pass. So it's not a, I don't, it's not, I'm trying to think of the word, like not a great place to be, but it was, I guess a little easier to know that we were honoring him in the way he wanted to be honored because we had listened to my own advice, had those discussions while he was in good mind and body. And then as we got closer and closer to that time, we knew what those wishes were, where everything was and what phone calls we had to make when that time came. And it also takes the, I mean, when something's happening to someone, whether it's fast or slow, um, the family doesn't want to expend their energy trying to figure that stuff out, right? No. Um, it's like, if you, if you, we all know that everybody at some point is going to pass. Like, I'm, no matter how old you are, I'm sorry, at some point, you're going to come to an ending. And if you, the more you deny it, the, the worse it'll be maybe for you, but definitely for the people who have to be there at the end. And you, 
I was talking to a woman who wrote a book, I think, I hope I get the name of the book right. It's called A Good Exit, I think it's called. Helping yeah. families have those conversations. It's like, you might not want to talk about it, but that's not going to stop it from happening. So have everything in place in advance as much as possible so that your family doesn't have to worry about that. They can just focus on you and or each other or whatever, you know, that needs to be. Yeah. Um, my what? One of my husband's uncles was, I think he was an engineer or something. So when he passed away, you just took the binder off the shelf. You opened the binder. You phoned the phone number in the front and everything else was taken care of. <laughs> he had it all like your dad. Sort of. Yeah. Well, and one of my business partners refers to it as the art of dying neatly. <laughs> so true. It's, yeah. It's a great concept because as you just illustrated, like we all know it's going to happen at some point. It's never easy, regardless of whether we know it's coming or not, but it's even worse when it's unexpected. Like I've yeah. got, I've had so many phone calls where it was unexpected and the family's obviously grieving, mourning, not in a good place. And if you've never talked about wishes or anything and don't know, is there insurance? Is there investments? Where is everything? Who do we call? Who do we talk? Like it is now probably one of the worst points in your life that you're ever experiencing and you're completely lost and don't know who's got what, what's your next phone call? What do you do? Whereas again, just by taking the time, getting organized, having those discussions, like I knew exactly what phone calls I had to make. And we obviously took time to mourn and grieve him and then just made a list of the phone calls we had to do, who we had to contact, divide and conquer, who was going to run with what. And it made it slightly easier to manage and deal with. But again, we were able to honor his wishes. Do you find that, um, like you're good, obviously with the clients, you're going to bring it up for them, right? Um, right. Do you find that um, there's people who won't have the conversations? Are there people who resist that? Definitely. Some people just do not want to talk about it at all. And I get it. It's not a fun discussion to have, but I always circle back to, okay, there's two guaranteed things in life. Death and taxes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So are you talking to your accountant, bookkeeper, <laughs> making sure your taxes are in order? For the most part, people are. I'm like, well, then why aren't we dealing with the elephant in the room? We know it's going to happen, and I can either help to facilitate it, or and maybe if you never want to have that discussion with your family, at least talk to a wills and estate planning lawyer get your will in order, get powers, powers of attorney in order, and at least create that binder, that document and name an executor to your estate. Let the executor know that you've named them to make sure that they're okay with that right. responsibility and then let them know where to find that. So yeah, that, as a minimum, I mean, you could have a will and pass away. And if nobody knows who your lawyer is or where you hit it, then uh, I don't even know what happens. What happens these days if you die without a will? Uh, then it's left up to the courts to decide. And there is a whole process about um, the way, the order in which um, it goes in terms of who can apply to be your executor. But it's just a mess. Bottom line, it's messy. It's more heartache on the family. And it, often it causes or can lead to families arguing. Right. Which is, you don't, you don't want that happening in a family. I mean, there's enough emotional discord going on like grieving and all the things that happen when someone passes um yeah. and i feel like i know we've been talking lots about wills and things but that is a part of estate planning right you're you're building 
an estate, you're building your assets to last as long as you can. And then it's what's going to happen to it, right? Yeah, exactly. And ideally, we want to try to keep as much of that wealth in the family as possible. And that's the main reason why I encourage those discussions is, okay, you've done a great job building all this wealth. And especially if there's a family business in the picture. Okay, so now what are we going to do to keep all that wealth in the family and ensure that the government doesn't get any more than what they're entitled to? And by we do that by having a will, having beneficiaries named on your insurance policies and having both. I always encourage both primary and contingent or secondary. Uh, beneficiaries again to keep the money in the family out of the estate um, also naming beneficiaries on the investments and having a succession plan for the business right i wonder sometimes if people don't think about that about their business like people do i'm even i'm guilty of this you know oh i'm gonna be around forever right it's like <laughs> You don't like to look down the road and say, what would happen if, and what, what would, and I've just, I've maybe, um, you know, when you're in your twenties and everybody's getting married and then you're in your thirties and everybody's getting divorced or having babies. So now I'm at that age where I keep ending up with people passing away or people that I know passing away. And you see such a variety of, um, of uh, bequests and sometimes i wonder if the people it was good at that time but they never went back and revisited it because it caused it's caused problems like just the way it was written or the way it was structured or maybe the advice that they got didn't turn out the way they intended so do you how often do you think people should go back and look at those things like how often do you meet with people to help them continue that kind of growth and intention and moving towards goals or adjusting goals? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Heather. And typically I let the clients dictate that, how often they want to meet. We meet a lot, obviously, in the beginning uh, to set things up because, again, it's going back to dating. <laughs> lots of questions of one another, uh, figure out, is this going to be a good fit for one another? Um, are they connecting with me? Am I connecting with them? Can I help them with what they, what their goals and objectives are? Am I the best fit to help them achieve that? And then I always encourage them, every time there's a major milestone, good or bad, please be reaching out to me. Like, don't wait until our next scheduled appointment. If you get married, have a kid, get a promotion, get an inheritance, win the lottery, lose your job somebody passes away in the family, like anything good or bad, let me know. And then we can take a look at the plan. Does that impact impact the plan? And do we need to make any adjustments? And same thing goes for all the other documents. So wills and power of attorney, those should also be looked at anytime something major happens in your life, because it may cause something to need some tweaking. Like maybe you named an executor who pre- deceases you that would not be so good no <laughs> <laughs> right yeah we always want to be going back to our plans reviewing them do they still make sense are they still up to date do we need to tweak them at all or are we still good to continue on the same path i kind of feel like you know it's like when you i feel like they should it should be almost annually. Like when you look, when you do that, where you look back, you know, New Year's Eve, you look back over the year, you see what was good, you see what was bad, you set your intentions for the upcoming year. And I mean, New Year's Eve is just one of those dates. I also do that same thing September. Like I do it a couple times a year. But um, it's, you know, I feel like annually would almost be give you a consistency so it's not like oh shoot i forgot i did get that promotion right i didn't call jamie darn it <laughs> or me, oh my god i broke up with that person i don't like them anymore i don't want them to be my power of attorney for health because i think they'll <laughs> have me put under <laughs> <laughs> no yeah i would definitely say at least annual at a minimum heather minimum wow okay yeah and I like I meet with all my clients at least once a year. Um, and then again, I let 
my clients dictate whether or not they want to uh, meet more often. Everybody gets my email address, my cell phone number, my calendar links. Uh, so my clients who really get it have all my calendar links saved and just book time when they need me. And I love that because I see pop up. Oh, Heather booked a meeting. I'm like, yes, Heather gets it. She needs something and she noted it in the calendar invite. I know the prep work I need to do. Something's changed. Heather wants to connect. Good. Can't wait to hear what's going on with Heather's life. And are you seeing people like, a, do you have clients kind of in the entire country or do you, are you mostly just in Ontario or? The bulk in Ontario. Um, so I've got my investments license in Ontario, Alberta and BC uh, because I've had some clients move uh, West right, and right. wanted to continue to work with me and um, also manage, I know people in both of those provinces. So I reached out and got some additional investment clients. So it was worthwhile for me to add uh, my licensing for those two provinces. For insurance, I'm only licensed in Ontario right now. And then mortgages, we go right across the country. It's funny. I never realized that some of these licenses were provincial because it was. I feel like it's all one country. You know, it's why yeah. wouldn't they all be? Yeah. Or? For the most part, all of the provinces and territories are fairly similar, with the exception of Quebec. Uh, Quebec does have different regulations. I will never be licensed in Quebec because I don't speak French. Uh, but I've got a great financial planner who I know in Montreal and I refer all of my Quebec clients or anybody that I meet who lives in Quebec, I refer them to him. Right. Yeah. It's good to have a network of people to always send it's even, I'll even do it if, uh, as a coach, you know, if I meet someone, I'm like, yes, you need coaching. I shouldn't be your coach. I think you should talk to this person. You know, you're not going to connect with everyone. Um, it's, and this is just going back a little bit because this was a thought that came and left and has come back about insurance. Um, I feel sometimes like getting insurance is like trying to get a cell phone pro plan. It's like I there's too many things. It's too confusing. I don't understand any of it. And when you go to the cell place, you don't. It's almost like buying a car. You don't always feel like you're getting the you don't you're never sure if you're getting the right deal the right phone the right plan it's just too hard to understand but i know that you would help people understand insurance oh, you yeah. find you find it people are always confused about insurance yeah and that's a great analogy heather and yeah that's why i highly encourage when it comes to insurance that you're talking to a certified financial planner or a chartered life underwriter, which is an insurance designation, so that they can explain the different types of insurance to you. Because yeah, it's really confusing. And people don't understand that there's four main types, life, critical illness, disability, long-term care. And we all have home and auto insurance because if you own a car, you have to have insurance. If you own or rent, you've got to have um, home or condo or tenants insurance. Like, so those are no brainers, but a lot of Canadians don't um, insure their biggest asset, which is us and our ability to go to work and earn a paycheck. And it quite often goes back to it's just too confusing and people don't understand it. So they're like, eh, I'm going to turn right. around the door because I don't know which phone or plan I want. There's too many options. I know. It's, it is super confusing. I have, I think I, all I have right now is disability and I don't think I've reviewed it in probably five years and I couldn't tell you what it was. Jamie, you and I need to talk. <laughs> That's a good example of when you need to circle back, review and book some time and ask questions. <laughs> right. Because when you go, when you get into a conversation, you're like, oh, shoot. Yeah, I don't actually know what I have. I couldn't tell you. I can tell you how much it costs me every month, but that's all I know. Right. And it's like your cell phone bill. Every now and then I'll open my cell phone bill. I'm like, how many gigabytes do I have? When did I get that? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so true. And I think people are afraid of it. Really. Yeah, um, well, as... 
again, it's the unknown and people don't like the unknown and I don't blame them, but that's why I always encourage people to ask questions. Like it's your money. It's your life. Ask questions. This it's not taught anywhere. So nobody should feel bad about asking questions. It's finally starting to be taught in some high schools, I think. And I know Ontario keeps talking about adding financial literacy to the high school programs. And I hope they make it mandatory as soon as possible, because this needs to be taught much more than some of the other courses that they teach. But in the meantime, I highly encourage everyone to be asking questions. And there really is no such thing as a stupid question because this isn't taught anywhere and there's so much confusing information out there. That's why you need to talk to a professional to figure out what's right for your specific situation. Yeah. You can't ask your uncle Bob because he, unless he's a certified financial planner, (laughs) (laughs) unless he's got his designations. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, everybody will have advice on what to do. Right. I remember my father-in-law or maybe it was my somebody, somebody in the grandfather type age group said you had to invest in real estate. But I'm like, well, what if I don't know that that's totally true anymore, you know, or what if that doesn't fit with my plan or what if it doesn't fit with my current financial status, you know, so. Yeah. um, And the the things that worked before. Yeah. Or buy this stock or buy Bitcoin. I, okay, that's great. It might be working for me, but what I'm doing may not work for you, especially if we don't have the same goals. And I don't know too many Canadians who are exactly alike with the same goals. Right, right. Totally makes sense. And how long are um, the... How long do you find that it usually takes for people to get themselves sorted to get their plans in place? I know it's like dating. Like, how many dates does it usually take? <laughs> the more open and honest they are, the sooner we can build those plans, get them in place. You're like a therapist for their money. Exactly. I'm a financial <laughs> therapist or a financial coach. <laughs> I like that because, you know, people have... It's people have hangups about all of that stuff, money, death, taxes, all of that. It's like you, what happens in the financial planner's office stays in the financial planner's office kind of thing, right? It's like, this is a person who's going to help you get yourself sorted and feel confident and be able to do the things you want to do. Yeah. No. And the first document that we sign is a privacy and confidentiality agreement. So I always go back to that when I can tell that people are kind of holding back and remind them, I said, remember that first document? I'm like your doctor. I'm like your lawyer. Everything we discuss is private and confidential. Nobody else is going to know about you, your goals, what we're trying to do. It stays here. And that usually helps them to relax and open up a bit more uh, because if I'm only as good in terms of making a plan for you to help you achieve your goals and objectives as you are in terms of being open and honest and giving me the information. Right. I build your plan based on the information you give me. And if you're not giving me all the information I need, guess what? Your plan likely won't help you achieve your goals and objectives or not as quickly or as soon as it could. Right. Or as easily. Exactly. And I know you're out there trying to like educate the country, everybody, young to old on how to, how would you describe it? Um, So my, and that's why I'm here today, Heather, is again, trying to connect with all of your listeners to provide some value with their life and help them protect what matters most to them, their family, business, health, and wealth. Right. And I like the fact that you're using it. It's like, I'm not trying to get your business. I'm trying to educate you so you can, I mean, um, I have met financial planners in the past who I've just felt like we're trying to make commission. So I'll be right up front, but I don't, 
we've known each other for a little while. I can tell you, I don't feel like that with you. Um, I feel like you're just really, really want people to understand so that they make the right decisions for themselves. Yeah, there's 38 million Canadians out there. I'm never going to be the financial planner for all of them. But That'd if I can connect schedule. with as many of them as possible and they learn something from listening to this podcast or the playback of it, then I've done my job. And also and it's going to cascade down through generations, right? So if the parents can get a financial um, understanding, insights, goals, demonstrate it, like you said, even with the insurance policies, cascade it down the grandkids, then those kids are going to be better prepared going yeah, forward, exactly. right? Yeah, because again, the sooner we get those younger generations started, the better. And when people have done a great job building up their wealth and overall portfolio, which likely includes some real estate too, we want to ensure that we protect that all, try to keep it all in the family, and then pass it down to all the future generations so that they can enjoy it. And make sure that they understand how to manage it, right? Give them the... Exactly. It's like they say, you know, lottery winners are usually broke within five years because it's like, didn't have it, suddenly have a lot of it, don't know how to manage it, spend it all. Burn <laughs> right through, back to square one. <laughs> if you win the lottery, make sure you phone Jamie. <laughs> Calm <me> now. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that you don't burn through it too quickly. <laughs> yeah, we don't want you to be that stat where you're bankrupt in three to five years. Let's make sure it lasts for life and then we pass it down to your future generations. Right, so amazing, so good. And I do think it's super important. And it is like I always talk about the six aspects of wellness and financial is a, is one of the the facets that we have to talk about, because when like people are say, oh, I I'd rather be broke. No, have broke and happy than rich and unhappy. But um, I'd like to be rich and happy. <laughs> so there's no there's no what is it? There's no, you know, um, it's not honor. It's not the word I'm looking for. Sometimes we romanticize the, you know, the just living as minimally as you can as like this more valid way of living. But I follow a guy who says, you can do more good in the world if you're rich. So money's not evil. Yeah. So you just like... I, Figure out how to have what you need, and then you will be in a better wellness place to help others, right? Exactly. And I love that that's the way that you're approaching financial planning. I love that um, you're just trying to help people understand how to ma manage their financial wellness so that they the rest of their life goes well, right? That's amazing. Do you have do you have any final thought, like a final thought for everybody? You may it may even be a repeat. That's totally cool. Yeah, final thought would be if you haven't already started, get started now. And get right. started by connecting with a financial professional, ideally a certified financial planner, and start asking questions. And talk about your goals your objectives, what matters to you, who matters to you, where do you want to be, by when, get your plan in place. And then once you do, monitor that plan, tweak it, and keep going back to that pro financial professional. And um, if you want to talk to Jamie, <laughs> all of everything will be in the chat boxes, the, the show notes, all Jamie's contact information. And Start even if you don't think you can afford to start, right? A lot of people think I don't make enough money to have a planner, but I think you're saying doesn't matter. Everybody yeah. should have a planner. Yeah, exactly. And there's all different types of planners out there. So there's no cost to work with me. I am 100% commission. I don't charge Canadians a fee to work with me because I don't believe Canadians should have to pay to try to get ahead. And again, this ties back into that it's not taught anywhere. So if people right. do have questions and they want to reach out with me, uh, one of the links we are sharing is my calendar. So book a time on my calendar when it's convenient for you. And we can talk about your specific questions or concerns and get you some answers. Amazing. 
Wow, I didn't know that. Even better. So good. Thank you so much. You're this welcome. has been, I, I also like the celebrity chats because I learn stuff <laughs> while I'm talking to these really cool people. And I so, love that I finally got celebrity status. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> no problem at all. Thank you so much, Jamie, for taking time and sharing all of the things that you know. And I highly encourage anyone to reach out and ask lots of questions because there's there's everybody's different and everybody's going to have different questions and circumstances. And the only way to get answers is to ask questions, right? Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, we'll connect again soon. Thank you Take again for having me, Heather. Take care. Hi, my friend. Thanks so much for listening to this entire podcast. If you found it useful and you're like me and you like, like helping others, please feel free to share this. Just give it a like. Give it a comment. If you found something useful in it, there's a chance that someone else will find something useful as well. Also, if you have any questions at all, I can absolutely help and I would love to help you can email me at heather at prosperityflowcoaching.com if you want more of this awesome content you can follow me on instagram heather stewart coaching you can follow me on facebook prosperity flow coaching and I have a personal request I want to help as many people as I can with these podcasts and if you could give me a review hopefully a good one <laughs> if you could share if you could send this out into the world I would truly appreciate it. I hope you have an amazing day and I hope that you find your way to wellness by getting back to me. Take care, my friend.